Hey, everybody, we're going to pick up our conversation we started last week. So if you haven't listened to last week's episode, go back and listen to that episode, and then you can listen to this episode. This is part two of a two-part series. Uh, I hope you enjoy. Welcome to The Friday Habit with Mark Labriola and Benjamin Manley. The Friday Habit is for small business owners, freelancers, and creatives who are ready to take their business to the next level. Join us as we discover how to apply the strategies we learn to grow our businesses, make more money, and live every day like it's Friday. I guess we can we can move on to you to more about your main career now. You know, I'd love to learn more about that and kind of what you've learned through some of that stuff. But I mean, it sounds like you kind of had had uh, experience in the company early on, moved away, came back, and then you're like, okay, fresh perspective. What was that like coming back? Was it like, oh, wow, this is, this is going to be a lot of work. I have no idea where to start. Or was it like, okay, did it feel smooth coming back in? Was it intimidating? <laughs> what was that? What was that like? It was like, uh, so this was, this was the conversation between the CEO founder of this company, who is also my dad, going, oh, so, so, you know, I'd like to, you know, I, I like to be busy. So how can I help again? Uh, what would you like me to do, dad, Mr. CEO? And he's like, go figure it out. <laughs> go figure it out. So when I, when I stepped into WM, I was like, all right, uh, let's talk to people. Let's see what's going on. Are there any gaps that people are feeling? Um, and then how can I try and bridge those gaps? So literally it was, I won't say it was overwhelming because I like to take you know things like step by step, but it really just, I came in to serve. Honestly, I came in to serve. So with that, with that approach, things were just um, exciting for me every day and they just grew, just grew. Yeah. I, that definitely seems like a theme, you know, you're saying, how can I help S- show up at school? How can I help? I feel like there's a lot to learn there. That's awesome. So as you started leading these different initiatives and stuff like that, what kind of problems did you see? What kind of lessons did you learn even the hard way? Like what mistakes did you make along the way that you're like, oh, you know what? I could have done that better the first time or something that that you think we could benefit from or even even small business owners might benefit from from your experience? No, for sure. And I mean, mistakes... Oh. I still make mistakes, you know, <laughs> I'm always learning something. Right. <laughs> it's like around the dinner table, I'll ask two questions. Like what was the best part of your day? And what was the best lesson you learned today? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way. I always ask like, what was your high point and low point of the day? But I should, I should reframe it. to so what did you learn today? <laughs> what did you learn today? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Oh gosh. But I'd say that throughout the, throughout my journey here, I've been at uh, WAM as a young adult. I'd say for now 17 years. So the best lesson that I have learned is to let go. And uh, in my, I don't know, I'd say about five, seven years ago, um, I was developing these accounts, which no one else in the company really wanted to, wanted to go into. We're also a minority owned business, right? But I tried to leverage that. There were a lot of really interesting programs that the large majors were allowing people like my company to participate in. So no one else really wanted to bother about it. But as I started gaining traction, it started to um, ruffle a few feathers within our organization going, well, hey, what's Ronnie doing? She's she's she has the potential of taking my accounts, yada, yada. So I had this conversation with, again, dad, my boss. And he was like, you know, he brought me into his office. He says, Ronnie, what you're doing is awesome. I've always wanted for our company to be represented and to have a different opportunity to grow. And you're, you've done, I mean, it took you two and a half years to get to where you are. So I love what you've done, but here's the thing. You need to let it go now. And I was like, wait a second, dad. First of all, I'm a woman in a very male dominated, you know, sort of industry, again, a minority, all of that, even though that never really bothered me, I knew there was definitely an uphill sort of fight, uphill battle even within my own company and, of course, in the industry. So I was like, uh, this is a really good chance for me to sort of prove what I'm trying to do, prove my my abilities and all of that. He says, you don't need to prove anything. Let it go. Just let it go. And I tell you, there's so much to do in this company, in this organization, that it's going to free you up to do more stuff. 
let me tell you, Ben, I went home and I cried. And I mean like the ugly cry, you know, <laughs> it's like no, uh -huh. throwing a tantrum inside. Don't want to let this go. These are my accounts. But anyways, I said, okay, there's got to be some sense into this. So uh, the next morning when I came back to, we had like this Monday morning sales meeting, the uh, sales meeting. And I very proudly handed over these accounts to, you know, certain people and they were shocked. They were like, are you serious, Randy? I said, yeah, you know, I brought it to this point. If you can go and slam dunk it, then all power to you, go do it. That was probably the most empowering lesson for me because what I realized is that in a company, it's not about a short-term gain. It's just not. If I'm thinking about long-term vision, long-term goals, legacy planning, Ben, I have a 200-year plan now. I'm wow. not kidding. That's awesome. And it's a very doable plan. People are like, 200 years, what are you talking about? I'm like, just <laughs> divide it, folks, into like 40 years is like, you know, one generation. You multiply that times five, I already, I'm already living in three generations. So it's not undoable. It's, it's not unrealistic. So, but that one little lesson became such a large stepping stone for me to think differently. And I would say that when I look back and I, the one thing that I tell people is that when you have the ability to let go, you're basically saying, I trust you and only good people make a good company. Great people make a greater company. And that's how I can tell you, even now we're building blocks. So we've got leadership teams around the world. And that's my message to them. My message to them is how can I empower you? How can I show that I trust you to take this company to where it needs to go? And how can I provide all the tools required so that you are, uh, you have all the abilities to go forward, but it's about me letting go continuously. Yeah. Do you feel like, what were some of your fears when you were letting go? Was it kind of like, okay, well, they're not going to do be able to do a hundred percent as well as I can because you had the experience and the knowledge and you already know the, the customer. Um, what were some of like the fears that you had? And it sounds like you were able to let those go, but when you, I'm just curious what those were, because I feel like a lot of us could probably identify with some of those fears, even in some of our businesses, you know? So what were some of those things that you were concerned about? Uh, so the fear number one was honestly, the first fear for me was that no one's going to respect me. That was the first one. No one's going to respect me anymore. They're just going to think that, you know, she did whatever. She, it was something was half, half done. Almost like the, they're perceiving it as, as giving up or something yes. like that, that you're like, oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So my fear was really directed towards, I would say my ego, like, oh my God, everyone's going to look at me in a certain way that she just gave up and, you know, she's, she's not good enough. But the other fear, like you mentioned, is that they're not going to, they don't have the history. They don't have the relationship. They're not going to be able to leverage all the hard work that has been put in and they're going to start from scratch again. So that was the fear was they're not going to progress the way I had intended it to go forward. So that was the second fear. And the third fear was not just are they going to not progress it, but they're just going to forget about it because this is all my fear was this was more a battle of the ego than really trying to make a good effort into a worthy cause. So my fear was that they're just going to, you know, put it to the, to the side. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think about, especially entrepreneurs with small businesses, I almost think sometimes we wear it as a badge of pride being busy or feeling like, Hey, in order to feel valuable as a person, I need to have a lot of responsibility, but it's okay to like, let those things go. So I feel like it's kind of a similar thing in the, in that situation. And and from that, what do you feel like happened? I mean, did any of those fears, were they validated, you know, when that happened or did things turn out okay or what ended up happening? Things turned out okay because of my approach. If I would have let sort of those negative thoughts come into me, like, oh, I really are good enough. I'm not good enough. Or I really did fail and I gave, I gave up and I would have kind of walked that talk, then sure, I would have been a failure. But I did it with pride. I did it with empathy. I really did do it with empathy. I'm like, guys, I know that you want to do good. And if I can help you do better, then here it is. Here, here's kind of like this gift basket. Go take it and run with it. So I think it was about the approach that enabled me to continue going forward. And yeah. honestly, that's how who I'm known in my company now is being an empathetic leader. They're like, you know, she gets it. And it's not about her. So she brings it up to the finish line, but then she allows us to move it forward. And that's okay. 
Well, and I, I see your attitude of how can I serve or how can I help makes so much sense. And I feel like it's cool to see someone be successful and coming back to you a, a business that's, you know, run by their dad and been being able to earn that respect. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's easy to probably, people probably at first like, okay, well, how's this going to go? You know, and the fact that you came in with that, like, how did you navigate that coming in? You know, was there certain things you did to try to not seem like you're getting preferential t- treatment? Or did you just say, you know what, I am getting preferential treatment. This is the way it is, you know, or how did, how did you approach all of that? Such a good question, because that's the first thing people assume. Like if you're part of the family or you're the owner's daughter, son, whatever, then you probably come in with some sort of entitlement and everyone's just going to be fearful of you or forcefully respect you and you'll get stuff done. Not in my case. Definitely not in my case. Again, I have this background of teaching, trying to help leadership, facilitating expression, all of this in the, in the back of my sort of portfolio, which for me meant that I am here to listen to you. I'm not coming in with as some authority figure. I want to feel your pain. I want to sit on the floor with you, sweep the same corners as you. And it wasn't just talk. It wasn't just talk. If somebody was out in the shop until seven and eight, I would stand there with them. If someone was in the back office trying to just, you know, crack a code and figure something out, I would sit there with them and we would do it together. So slowly but surely, people said, you know what, she's really not in it for the title or, you know, any of the any of those sort of stereotypes. But she's here literally to support and help. And that's really what happened. Organically, people started to come to me and ask for advice or, hey, how can we solve this? And I was able to solve it together. You have the solutions. I'll help you find it. Organically, people started to report to me. And so, therefore, it was so easy and a very natural transition when I got promoted to CFO. I can tell you, I could be a global CFO all day long, but it would mean nothing, nothing if people didn't respect that, I guess, position on their own. So it was, it was a very organic transition, which... I'm, I'm grateful for, as I would say. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is I've been, I guess there's a philosophy that I've always lived by, which is called kind of like that earn to return. And I know in the business realm, people either earn for personal gains or, you know, they'll earn for giving back. And for me, it's, it's always the latter. And when I think about that and I put everything, every action that I do, I know it has to impact someone, somebody else. And people see that. So I think that has also enabled sort of us to grow together. Yeah. I mean, even what you're saying about just listening in, in actually sitting down and listening to someone, I feel like that's one of the things that affects um, job satisfaction the most is how, what your relationship is with your manager or your boss or whatever it might be. That's, I think that's, they say that's like the number one reason people quit jobs is that, is that relationship not being good, you know what I mean? Which I get. One of the things that makes your relationship with your boss can be great is if they actually listen to the problems that you have and figure out, okay, let's figure out a solution and stuff like that. One thing we do at my company is we just have like an open Slack channel where throughout the week, anybody can drop in like, hey, uh, I noticed that, uh, you know, this project kind of went off the rails for this reason, you know, can we talk about it? And so as a team, every Friday we get together and can bring up any problem that happened, any issue or any new idea, like as a team, talk through it and then we'll make a decision. So it's like, they know this is not just going in a black hole comment box somewhere where no one will ever see it. It's like, how do you keep that loop in there where you're getting real feedback and stuff like that? So I feel like that probably, to me, it seems like it would have earned you a lot of respect just the fact that you actually listened and tried to make things better. Like that gives people a lot of hope, you know? You're so right. You're so right. And listening is one thing. And like you mentioned, uh, listening and being transparent. Transparency has been the key to our success. Really, just being transparent in all forms, whether, you know, you're irritated, uh, happy, joyful, all of it. But just being transparent and knowing that everything that we do is for a purpose. It's not personal. It's for a purpose. There's a mission that we're all trying to achieve together. So it's that purpose. That, number one, has really helped us greatly. And number two, as you mentioned, it's the execution of it. It's not just talking about it. It's, it's the nonverbals that really count at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, no, it totally makes sense. Well, can you tell me a little bit about your book? You know, um, I would love to learn 
more about that, what you talk about in the book, how does that relate to what you've learned through all these different things you've done and throughout your journey? So yeah, maybe you can tell me a little bit about that. And what, what inspired you to write it even? Right. So the name of the book is Seven Letters to My Daughters. And uh, definitely my daughters inspired me to write it. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> right? Um, uh, but the book is really not just for daughters. It's about the human experience. I always say all of our emotions, pain, joy, frustrations, how to overcome something, they're all a part of the human experience. So it's really for sons and daughters of the world. There's a typical science, well, a traditional science that says that every seven years, our cells uh, regenerate. And so, honestly, it's like we are new people every seven years, right? That's cool. Yeah, that's really cool. So when I took a look back and I said, okay, I'm going to write my life story and the lessons that I've learned from it, I was literally, literally able to divide my life into seven-year chunks, seven-year cycles. So the first seven years of my life, I was a a single child. So I was, I thought I was a daughter, but actually I was born a girl, which I realized later on. Then later on, I was a sister when my siblings were born. And so go on, so on and so forth. Every seven years, I played a very, very specific role, which offered me such unique lessons, such unique lessons of love, of leadership, and of legacy. I didn't even know what legacy meant when I was of those ages. But now when I look back, I'm like, oh, if I wouldn't have gone through that, I never would have understood these lessons now. So or or my perception now, everything that I learned over the last course of my 50 years, 49, seven times seven, 49 years, I put into this form of a book. And I'm hoping that it's a gift. It's a gift so that if people can relate to some of the stories, like I said, the some of the really hard, excruciating pain stories also, but find a message that will help them move through their experiences quicker, faster, better, then I'm hoping that this book will be a gift as as people read it. And I do live by all those lessons today. And the big one, like I mentioned to you, is letting go and I understand legacy. So at the end of it, I'm hoping to impact hearts minds and just that overall awareness of who we are as human beings. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's so cool that your your life is divided up into seven seven years and it's <laughs> yeah, 49. It's it's really beautiful. It really is. It's like if you're it feels like it was meant to be. It's really cool. <laughs> it was. That's really awesome. Yeah, and it's it's really cool to hear too that you know you were able to find hope through a lot of those even the difficult experiences and stuff like that. And how, so if somebody was curious about the book, where could they, where could they find that? What's the best way to, to get all of that? Sure. So uh, first it's on Amazon, okay. Seven Letters to My Daughters. And uh, if you just go on to RaniPuranik.com, so R-A-N-I-P-U-R-A-N-I-K.com, you'll find links to this book and also other things that I do. We're starting our a new charter school here in Houston, Texas. Well, if everything goes through, it's in its application process right now. You're not busy at all, are you? Nope, not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Why, why are you talking to me right now? You got stuff to do. <laughs> but again, it goes back to that same philosophy is that if whatever we're putting together as a multinational corporation, Ben, if we cannot return it back to the communities, the local communities, then what are we doing all of this for? You know, we've got to be able to make other people's lives better. We just that that's my purpose. That's the reason why I get up in the morning. I'm like, all right, what's my assignment today? <laughs> yeah. 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 How can I help? I mean, you're like, how can I help the world at that point? So yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Well, Hey, this has been really, really helpful, inspiring, informative. Um, if, if there was something that you would, you know, recommend people do this week to become a better leader, what would you recommend? Just one action item they could take to work with their team. What, what could help them become a better leader this week? Going back to the let go thing. What is the one thing that a leader should try to let go of and watch how it blossoms. Just try to let go. And it takes courage to let go. But think about what that one thing could be for different departments. It could be for different levels of your executive team. Think about that. All right. Awesome. So uh, I'm going to just go through. I usually take some notes. So I have a couple quick takeaways from our conversation, things that I want to remember for later. So uh, I think I've got about four or five of them here. So one is, sounds like one of your themes is how can I help? So ask, how can I help? 
Sounds like that's a great path to success and just being useful and helpful in an organization and gaining trust as well. So ask, how can I help? Uh, And if somebody doesn't tell you what to do, go figure it out. You need to learn how to let go. Uh, I'd say also you mentioned in a company, it's not about the short-term gain. It's about the long-term gain. And uh, good people make a good company, but great people make a great company. Those are a couple of the takeaways from today. Well, awesome. So everybody go ahead and check out Ronnie's website, check out her book. And uh, thank you, Ronnie, for being on the Friday Habit. Where can people find you online? Uh, RonnieBronick.com, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, all the usual handles. All right, perfect. Awesome. And uh, thank you guys for listening and go to thefridayhabit.com to find show notes for the episode. There you can also find links to our websites and ways to get in touch. At the bottom of the page, you can download our guide to the Friday Habit system that will show you how to set aside one full day each week dedicated to working on your business instead of in your business. And if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review in the Apple Podcasts app. Thanks for listening to Friday Habit. And until next time, live every day like it's Friday. Friday.